My, uh, at almost 60, my testosterone's been waning a bit, but it just went up like 50%. Thank you for the Tom Cruise compliment. I don't believe it, but that was pretty nice. Uh, I need a can. I just want to crush a can against my forehead right now. All right, how many of you saw Top Gun Maverick? Okay, so I'm not going to, spoiler alert, I may talk about the movie a little bit today. How many of you saw it when, uh, the, er, the early version, 1986? Okay, last question. How many of you saw it when it came out in 1986? Come on, Top Shelf. Put your hands together for Top Shelf. So I was, a, I was a missionary in Malaysia, and I kept hearing about Madonna, this one named Madonna, and this, this new CD, actually it wasn't a CD, it was an album back then, uh, called Like a Version. I go, man, I got to come home and listen to that, and I kept hearing about Top Gun. So I came back, watched Top Gun, loved it, loved it. My favorite scene is early in the movie when they're in that inverted dive, and all of a sudden Maverick flips the plane over, and they're like cockpit to cockpit, and then Goose takes a picture and gives them like the international sign of love and good favor. Remember that part? loved that scene, loved that scene. But what that movie did to me, like all like brave, you know, manly kind of movies, is it, it brought the question up, wow, am I that brave? Am, am, I, am I that manly? Am I man enough? It's the same thing that happened to me, you know, it's Braveheart. That, that movie ruined me for like 30 minutes. I was quiet after the movie. You know, after watching him get disemboweled, he goes, freedom! And I walk out and I go, whoa, that dude is a man. Am I, am I, a, am I, a, am I a man? You know, am I a man? Any of you guys, you know, confess a little insecurity once in a while, you're like, am I really man enough? Enough. Okay. So um, I grew up moving all over the place. And uh, every time I'd move, I'd have to figure out who the alpha male was in the school, the neighborhood, or the bully. You guys growing up, moving around, you kind of know what I'm talking about. You gotta, who do I look out for? And when I lived outside of Philadelphia, there was a guy named Weasel Pimley. Actually, Stephen Pimley, but we call him Weasel. I have no idea why. But he was a year ahead of me and about six inches taller than me. And uh, we, we'd play sports and stuff. And there was about a one in 10 chance after we'd play basketball, pick up basketball or football, we would get into a fight. He was the, he was the alpha male, but I was a better athlete. And so we were, I was batting about 500 with, or that's not, it's boxing, it's not 500. Um, I was about five and five, something like that with him. And then one day he cleaned my clock. And my dad had been a boxer, so he goes, okay, enough of this. So he got me a punching bag, and he got me a weight set. I'm in eighth grade, and I'm, like, trying to pump up and stuff, you know. And then he's teaching me footwork and crosses and jabs and things. I'm, I'm ready for weasel. If it ever happens, happens again, I'm going after weasel. I'm done getting beat up by weasel. And then uh, I was sitting on my back porch one day, and, and then off in the distance, I saw about two houses over. We had these big yards. Uh, I saw weasel just cleaning this kid up and just, like, working him over in the face. And everything inside me said, you need to get out there and, and protect this guy. And I just froze, completely paralyzed. And I didn't respond. Now, ladies, I'm not advocating that uh, men in the room teach their boys to fight and that kind of stuff. But for me, that was a really significant moment because uh, I, didn't, I didn't act. I wasn't brave. I, I didn't do the courageous thing. I didn't come to the rescue of this kid. And it brought up that question. I think for the first time I recognized it, am I man enough? I spent like the next 20 years in therapy asking questions like that. My therapist, am I man enough? You know, I, I went over, I rehearsed that story over and over because it became a symbol for every time I wouldn't engage when I needed to engage. And I think all men struggle with this to some degree, right, men? You, you don't engage with a problem at work. You, know, you have a problem employee, you don't engage. Or, or you don't talk about your feelings with your girlfriend or your, or, or your, your spouse, and you don't engage. Or you know there's this person that... Um, that desperately needs to hear the message of Jesus Christ, the message of hope. And you know that like, eternal destiny is on the line, but you don't share your faith when you are given the opportunity. You don't step in. You don't engage. And it raises the question for us, am I man enough? We lose self-respect every time we don't step up and we engage the problems in our, our lives. It could be plumbing. In my house, it's plumbing right now. So <laughs> am I man enough, all right? Uh, and and this, this question gets asked at different stages in a, in a man's journey. So there's all these, like, schematics for the man's journey. Mankind Project has one. Robert Bly has one back in the, the 90s when the, the men's movement began, you know. Um, my favorite schematic about the men's journey, the stages in the journey, uh, is that of John Eldridge in some of his work because I think he, he does the best job staying true to, like, biblical imagery. And so today we're going to use his sort of schematic about, about the stages a man goes through as he, as he grows up into manhood. And uh, the book that I'd recommend on this topic is Father by God. Um, the older version was The Way of the Wild Heart. That's the one I read. But I like the title of this better because God wants to father us. And he wants us to grow in the gaps as men 
where, uh, where we have gaps, where we need some fathering. So um, a caveat and then a suggestion as to how to listen to this message. Um, if you're new, it's a different kind of message. We're not going through the book of Acts today. This is more topical. Uh, but I do want to say this as a caveat. Um, the antidote to toxic masculinity, because this topic always raises up that issue for us, right? Especially the women in the room. Now, it, it's not for, for men to become more like women, which is sometimes the cultural message. Because the opposite of manhood is not womanhood. The opposite of manhood is boyhood. Agree? The, the problem isn't that men need to become more like women. The problem is that boys need to become men. And that's what the masculine journey is all about. So Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Um, nothing wrong with being a boy. Nothing wrong with being a child. I have a 27-year-old boy, and I, man, and I got a four-year-old boy, okay? And if my four-year-old boy doesn't become like my older son, who is a man, then we got a problem. So boys need to become men. That's what this message is about. It's about maturing and becoming men. Uh, how to listen to this message. Women, pray for the guys around you, okay? Please do that. I mean, this one's for the dads, right? We're focusing on men. It's Father's Day. I see you. Uh, I got some eye candy for you with some pictures here in a little bit. You're going to love it. Okay, I see you, I see you. But you women, you do a great job. You read about this stuff. You listen to podcasts. You talk about, you know, women's issues and stuff. Um, most guys don't read books after they get out of college, and they don't talk about this stuff. And that's why we're doing this. We're focusing on the guys today and talking about what it means to be a man and grow into the, the manhood that God has for all of us. All right, so six stages in the journey. Guys, as you're listening to these stages, most of us are in a home stage. Like, we're all in all the stages at the same time, but we tend to be most at home in a particular stage. So ask yourself the question, what stage am I primarily in right now? And then I think just as important, where do I have some gaps? Where do I ne need to ask my Heavenly Father to father me where I have some gaps in my masculine journey? That'll make more sense as we go through the, the stages. All right. Um, we didn't pray. I'm going to pray for us. We'll jump in. Uh, Father, thank you for Father's Day. And uh, on this day, we want to honor all the men in the room who are fathers. And uh, may they be loved well and honored well. And yet we recognize that uh, as fathers, we fail and we all have gaps. And so, Heavenly Father, will you be the father we need today? And will you help us fill those gaps? And, and then will you help the men in the room uh, have a clear understanding of what manhood is from a biblical vantage point, And then help us grow into it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. All right, stage number one, the beloved son stage. Um, the beloved son stage is that heir of a man's life when he learns he's dearly loved by his earthly father, hopefully, and his heavenly father, definitely. Um, this is where a boy must answer the question for himself, am I loved? Am I loved? So Jesus went through this stage along with all the other stages. Um, his father's name was Joseph, and we know from Scripture he was a Talmudim. It, it gets translated righteous man in, in the New Testament, but we get lost in translation there a little bit. A Talmudim was a man who uh, made it through Torah school. All the Jewish boys would go through Torah school. They memorized the first five books of the Bible. But a Talmudim would go on and memorize all the Hebrew scriptures. And so he was a righteous man by training and by reputation. So we don't know how many years Jesus had with his father Joseph. We know he died at, at a certain point, And we know he was a carpenter. And, and you know, doubt loved his son as long as he was alive. Not perfectly because he was a sinner like all men, but he loved him well. But his heavenly father filled in his gaps. And his Heavenly Father answered the question at the deepest level, am I loved? And so we read about Jesus in his baptism in Matthew 3, 17. As he's coming out of the water, his Heavenly Father said over him, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Do you know that's what Jesus says over you at your baptism? This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased. When you come out of that water, you are spotless and holy before the God of the universe. So Jesus knew about his father's love. He was the beloved. Now this is super important because a man must know he's a beloved son or he will be desperate his whole life. He will always be trying to get attention from others. He'll be insecure and he will wear out the women in his life with a question, am I lovable? The question only God can answer. So I, uh, for those of you who are new to restoration, I mean like uh, Post-COVID, you don't know much of my story. Pre-COVID, you guys know too much of my story probably. But I, I grew up in a distant home. So uh, my parents grew up in northwest Arkansas during the Depression, during the, the Dust Bowl years. They were always trying to survive. Um, their descent was from uh, Scandinavians, Irish, German people, and a little bit of Cherokee Indian. 
And so growing up, having w- experienced what they went through, they didn't spend a lot of time telling me that, like, they love me, okay? I, I think I heard my mom say it a couple times. I never, growing up in my 18 years at home, ever once heard my dad said, say, say to me, I love you. Never heard it. And so I, I took that question all over the place. I took it to performance. I always thought, man, if I just perform well enough at this or that, then, uh, you know, I'll be lovable, okay? I, I took it to women. Uh, am I lovable? Am I lovable? I was desperate for love. And, and then at the age of 16, I began to follow Jesus. But I had such a gap here for about the next 20 years or so, I kept asking God all the time, am I loved? And, and usually it would happen in the morning. I'd wake up and I, I'd reflect on the day before, you know, before the, the wild horses of the next day come running at you. I'd think about what happened the day before. And I'd think about where I failed, where I didn't perform well. And I found myself asking God that question. God, do you love me? Do you, do you love me? I just felt desperate to know, know he loved me. And this went on for like 20 years on a regular basis. God, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then one morning, it was like he was frustrated with me. I could tell he was aggravated because I kept asking him the question all the time. It was like me going up to uh, Granola Pass with my kids on Thursday. Dad, when are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? Like, uh, we, oh, we'll get there when we get there. I, I could tell I was like frustrating him. And, and I started laughing because I feel like he said to me, when are you going to stop asking me the question I've answered so clearly through the cross? And I needed him to be harsh with me in that way because I started laughing going, yeah, you know what? I guess you do love me, don't you? And that was the day that that idea about Jesus dying from the cross and God loving me so much he'd sent his son for me went from my head down into my heart. And it changed me significantly. It made me more secure. It grounded me. It's not that I don't ask that question from time to time. I still need my Heavenly Father's love. I just don't ask the question with the kind of desperation that I once did. Many of you men, you need God to answer that question for you. Um, A.W. Tozer once said, learn your father. That's a great line. Learn your father. Learn who your Heavenly Father is experientially. And let him answer all your questions for you. Now, if there's one habit I, I wish upon our whole church, it's the habit of on a regular basis, a daily basis, just spending time in the presence of our Heavenly Father, letting Him love us. Whether you're a morning person or an evening person, letting God just tell you and let Him experience, or you experience His love on a daily basis is one of the most critical things we could do as a church. We need His love like we need oxygen. So my favorite time of the day is I'm in the morning drinking coffee, I'm at the table at the kitchen table, I'm out in my office, and I'm just spending time in God's word, and I'm just trying to be still before him. This morning I sat down on a weight bench, and I just sat there just like dwelling in his love. It's such a powerful experience. For a man to grow into mature manhood, he has to know he's loved by his heavenly father. Amen, somebody? All right, all right. Um, Stage number two, it's the cowboy stage. Luke Grimes, ladies, I was thinking about you this week, okay? Okay, a little eye candy for the ladies, okay? But eyes on the pastor too, all right? All right. Okay, uh, th- this is the stage in a man's journey where he learns that life is an adventure. And here he asks the question, is there an adventure worth living for and therefore worth dying for? And, and this is why got, guys like cowboy movies. We, we like, you know, like uh, Yellowstone and Tombstone and Unforgiven. We like cowboy movies because the cowboys are always on an adventure. You know, they're like... They're rescuing cattle, and they're rescuing women, and they're shooting rattlesnakes and stuff, you know. And we, we love cowboy movies because being a cowboy is like a, a grand adventure. Well, Jesus went through this stage during what are known as his silent years, age 12 to 30. And we don't know a lot. We don't have any, any text about those years. Uh, but we know he lived in Nazareth most of the time. And I've been in Nazareth. Um, even now, it's not a big metropolis. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And so Jesus grew up in, in the wilderness, an arid wilderness, but a wilderness nonetheless, with uh, lions and bears and snakes and, and bandits and, and, and Roman soldiers and stuff. And so he, he lived in a dangerous environment. And, and he lived with his father, learning how to work with his hands in the carpenter shop. Don't think wood. There's no wood around Nazareth. He, he worked primarily with stone. And it says about Jesus in Luke 2.52 that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This is a very critical stage. A, a man needs to know he's on an adventure. That he's a part of a story, this is key, a story bigger than himself. He he needs to feel a little wild, ladies. A a man needs to feel like you can't quite tame him, even though you may try. Right, guys? How many of you women have seen Yellowstone? I'm not recommending it, by the way. I'm a pastor. Okay, okay, okay. 
All right, so for the four of you who've seen it, uh, if you had to marry either uh, Casey Dutton or Jamie Dutton, who would you choose? Casey every time. Everyone to, so a little bit about Casey and, and uh, well, one, Casey's played by Luke Grimes, so he's kind of good looking. Uh, but he's, he's kind of wild. Like, he always go, he, this guy could come unhinged at any moment. He's mysterious, though. And he's brave. He's courageous. He steps into danger. Jamie always runs from danger. He's hesitant. He's insecure. He's unprincipled. Every woman would prefer Casey over a Jamie any day. Women will try to tame their men, but they don't really want to tame men. So how does a man grow in the, in the cowboy stage? Well, first of all, you've you got to join God's story. You, you need a story that's bigger than your own, a story that's bigger than the, the story that the culture gives to you, right? So here's what the culture tells you that you should do as a man. Okay, make good grades so you can go to a decent college, so you can make a decent salary, so you can raise a family, raise kids, and have some adventures and some vacations with them, so you can send them to college, so you can have grandkids, so that you can get old and start playing golf and collect seashells in Florida, okay? <laughs> that's, that's the story we're given. Guys, is that a big enough story to live in? No. We need a much, much bigger story, and God has a bigger story for us. More on that in a few moments. Um, if our story is too small, our life will be small as well. Uh, number two, you got to do dangerous stuff. As a guy, you need to blow some stuff up, okay? If you need permission, blow some stuff up. Yeah, not him. Um, th- when brothers want to blow up brothers, that's not a good idea, okay? Um, there's no adventure without a little danger, okay? So learn how to ice climb. Um, learn how to kill what you eat. Um, realize there's a devil. Um, paint something that you think is beautiful that other people might think is profane, okay? Um, learn how to change a diaper. One of the most terrifying things I've ever done in my life was change my first diaper, okay? It, it gets even scarier. Learn how to talk about your feelings with women. That's super scary stuff, okay? But face the danger in your life and grow and, and courage. But don't be stupid. Don't be an idiot. Don't go get drunk and then ice climb, okay? Not, not a good idea. And then learn how to work hard because being a cowboy is really hard work. Proverbs 13.4 says, the soul of the slugger craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. So many men, they, they don't grow in the cowboy stage. They don't live this bigger adventure God has for them. They don't step into danger in, in the world because they're too busy in their pajamas playing video games with, in mom's basement, okay? That they don't want to work hard. And men who don't work hard, they live their whole lives with cravings that are never satisfied. I mean, just taking your kids camping is a lot of work, okay? It's always work, but it's always worth it. But the, the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. So learn how to work. Cowboy up. All right? Okay. Stage number three, the warrior stage. Warrior stage. Tom Cruise, 1986. A little bit better looking than 2022, ladies, in my opinion. Uh, we, we, love, we love Maverick because, you know, Maverick, he, he enters into, like, this, this warrior space. He, he takes on MiGs. He blows up nuclear plants. He, he's a warrior. That's why guys love war movies. It, it, it arouses in us this desire to be a warrior and, and to be brave. And it reminds us, these movies remind us as we look at the biblical story that our God is a warrior. He's a warrior and we're made as men in his image. And women, you are too, warrior S's among us. Okay? Isaiah 42, 13 says, um, the Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter shout, yes. He will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. Do you know Jesus was a warrior? He, he was the ultimate warrior. Now, in so many of the movies about Jesus, I just go, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't get into this. For years I watched Jesus movies and I go, I can't relate to this Jesus. He's wearing like a dress and it's, there's like not even dirt on it and his nose isn't broke. He's just, you know, he's got a lamb around his shoulders. And then I started watching The Chosen. I like that Jesus. How many of you have seen The Chosen? That's a good Jesus, man. So he's, he's winsome, he's funny, he's got a big nose, but he, you kind of get this idea with him, there's some gravitas to this guy. Like this guy is like, not a guy you would want to mess with. Jesus was a, a warrior, okay? And he wants to teach us as men to be warriors. Um, this stage matters because a man has to answer the question, is he brave or not? So how does a man grow as a warrior? Well, first of all, we engage those problems. Like we talked about in the introduction, we, we, we engage the problems that we want to run from. I don't care if it's a plumbing issue or it's a technology issue or it's talking about your feelings with your wife or changing that diaper or, or it's sharing your faith with a person who desperately needs to know the hope of Jesus Christ. We don't run from problems, we engage them. That's what men do. That's how we grow as warriors. 
And the second thing is we need to realize that we are always at war. We're always at war. Most men are asleep and they don't realize they are at war every single day. And the people around them are at war. And they're called by God to engage the battle for other people's hearts every single moment of every single day. So it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This passage is saying there is a war going on around us all the time. And as men, we have to learn how to fight. So you have to know your enemy. We could do a whole series on this. We probably need to sometime soon. So your enemy is not just the world or the culture. You have a literal spiritual entity of evil that's coming against you every single day. And so you need to know your enemy. It helps to know his names. So the primary name for our enemy in the Bible is Satan, which means adversary. Our adversary's men is not inflation. Okay? It's not, it's not uh, our wife and her nagging problem that she's wrestling with with us, something she doesn't like about us. It's not an employee that's underperforming. Our, our ultimate adversary is Satan himself. Um, he's also called the devil, which means accuser. So that voice you sometimes hear inside of you that's accusing you and condemning you and telling you that you're not enough and that's shaming you, that's not just you. That's the devil. He's the accuser. Um, he's the tempter. He's the one behind our temptations. He's constantly tempting us to diminish our manhood by doing that which is you know, sinful and unrighteous. He's also the father of lies. I mean, every single day, outside of us and inside of us, we face this disinformation campaign. All these lies that we have to fight in order to win the spiritual battles that God's calling us to engage. And so to do that, we need to know our weapons. Got to know our enemy. Got to know our weapons. Um, can you imagine like some guy in the Ukrainian army and he's being sent to war and he doesn't know how to work a gun. He doesn't know how to shoot it, doesn't know how to clean it, doesn't know how to keep it in good shape. Now, men, when they go to war, they, they, they know their weapons. But most men, they don't know how to spiritually fight. And they need to be trained. And our Heavenly Father wants to teach us how to fight. And so 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are uh, divinely powerful to demolish strongholds. We have these weapons God wants to give us that we can fight. I mean, the enemy, just like any enemy, has strongholds in our lives and the lives of other people. He, he's given us weapons. God gives, gives us weapons to be able to fight. The primary weapon is the word of God. So Jesus, in, in Matthew chapter 4, he's, he's fighting Satan himself. And, and Satan accuses him. And Satan lies to him. And then Jesus fights with what's called the sword of the spirit in the Bible, the word of God. And he takes verses from Deuteronomy that he's memorized and he fights Back. He fights the lies and the accusations with the truth of God. Um, the other weapon is prayer. When we get on our knees and we pray that God will help us with the battles we, we're fighting, he unleashes the host of the angels in heaven on our behalf to fight for us and with us. Is that good news? Okay. So as men, we've got to be warriors. We've got to learn the nature of our battle, the nature of our enemy, learn our weapons, and we've got to learn how to fight. Um, stage number four, the lover stage. Um, this is where a man discovers beauty. Now, I, I love this Celtic proverb, never give a man a sword who can't dance. A man who can't dance but who has a sword is a dangerous man in a bad way. The question that men ask in this stage is, is there a beauty worth pursuing? Is there a beauty out there that I, I can pursue and that will wake up my soul? So Jesus, uh, he was a poet as well as a warrior. I mean, he could fight Satan. Uh, he, he could hold his own in a theological debate, but he wrote the Psalms. Some of the most beautiful poetry that's ever been, been written. Um, he, he loved lilies and flowers. Um, he, he loved the beauty in women. He fought for the beauty in women. Okay. He, he fought for the woman caught in adultery. He fought for uh, the woman at the well. He fought for his mother to protect his mother and to cherish his mother. Jesus was a lover of beauty and he was a lover of women. And as men, we're made to be lovers of beauty and women as well. And if a man does not become a lover, he'll be dangerous in a really bad way. He'll be a mercenary, not a soldier. He'll be a sperm donor, not a father. He'll be religious, but not have a relationship. That's not the kind of man we want to be. My father did a pretty good job with me in the cowboy stage. He made me cowboy up. He would, just, he would create work for me. 
to build a work ethic. He crazy stuff he had me do. Uh, warrior stage, he was a boxer, like I said. He did that warrior thing with me. But I didn't see my, my dad romance my mother, and that left a hole in my manhood. And we didn't sit around talking about poetry. <laughs> I'm not sure we ever used the word beauty in our household. Okay? And so that's been the primary place where I've had a gap in, in my masculine journey. And I've needed my Heavenly Father to help fill that gap. And so this is why I backpack and hike and hunt and fish. Um, Henry Thoreau once said, most fishermen spend their entire lives without knowing it's not the fish they're after. Okay. Ladies, when we go outside to go fishing and hunting, it's really about beauty more than anything else. It's not about what we're chasing. And, and so for me, it's Mount Falcon. I mean, I, we, we hike and backpack and go different places. But on a pretty frequent basis, especially in the summertime, I go to Mount Falcon because it's, it's close by. And I've been climbing Mount Falcon for 30 years. And when I was in my 30s, I would, I would run up Mount Falcon. And then in my 40s, I would fast hike up Mount Falcon. And now I stroll up Mount Falcon <laughs> very, very slowly, partly because I no longer have the fitness to do anything else, but, but also because slowing down helps me see beauty. And so the other guys in the teaching team have been making fun of me because for the first time in my life, I'm, I'm seeing flowers. Like I used to just run past flowers, you know. Now I stop and I go, wow, that Columbine's gorgeous. Look at that painted brush. Like I actually stop and I admire the flowers. And, and I've got a, uh, a uh, cow elk tag for this fall. I'm going to hopefully shoot an elk. But now when I see the deer, I stop to them. And I started talking to the deer this week. I literally was talking to the deer. There were five deer. Like it was a, there was a mother doe and uh, two does and two little bucks, like the felt in their little antlers and stuff. And I stopped this last Thursday, and I was talking to them. I was like, you guys are so cute. <laughs> man, you're... You know, what's for breakfast today? You little bucks, man, you're going to be warriors someday. I actually sat, I was, they're like 10 or 15 yards away because they're stupid. I, I was hunting, I could have killed them with a rock or something, but I'm talking to them. I, I, I walked away going, I'm becoming like freaking St. Francis. I'm talking to the animals and the flowers and what is happening to me? Well, what's happening to me is I'm learning to appreciate beauty. Like, I'm, I'm realizing I need beauty. I, I need God to wake up my soul. And when I notice beauty, it softens my heart. It softens the warrior spirit within me, and it makes me more compassionate. So how do we grow as lovers? Uh, we spend time enjoying beauty. We get outside, we read poetry, we, we take up photography, we learn how to play an instrument. Uh, we look at flowers. If you guys don't have a girlfriend, you can buy me flowers, okay? We'll trade off the flowers, okay? Uh, and then second, we pursue women. Because women are the ultimate beauty. And some guy sitting next to his wife right now needs to say Amen. Right? Uh, women are the ultimate beauty. Uh, Frederick Beekner, he, uh, when he was a boy, he fell in love with a girl in Bermuda. And it just, I mean, head over heels in love with this beautiful young girl. And he later said, all the beauty I longed for, beyond the beauty I longed for in her. My interpretation. He was enthralled, captivated by her beauty. But he recognized the beauty in her pointed him to the greater beauty, which is the beauty of God. So my wife's in the front row, and when I look in her face, I see the ultimate beauty, and her face gives me peace. And yes, I'm being syrupy. Email me. Go ahead. <laughs> but but um, her face, as beautiful it is, as it is, it points me to the creator of her face and the creator of all beauty, my heavenly Father. And what our hearts long for more than anything else is the beauty of our Father's face. And one day we're going to see it. Between now and then, we find this beauty in flowers and animals and sunsets and pulling trout out of a river and in the face of our women. Amen, guys? Okay. All right. So, men, let's become lovers. Let's become poets. Let's learn how to dance. Let's discover beauty. Um, stage number five, the, the king stage. And we got Tom Cruise again. No, who do we have here? Aragorn. Yeah, I got the wrong thing here. That's Aragorn. What? The rings. I have Tom Cruise in my notes, but anyway, we'll go with the, we got this one, we got this one. I should watch the movie, huh? All right. Back to the stage. Okay, get, forget the movie. Okay, a man on the stage learns to rule. Did I skip a stage? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I've done this a few times today. Okay, this is the stage where a man learns to rule over a kingdom, be it his job, his ministry, or the influence he has with his, his family and his friends. And the question he asks here is, am I worth 
following? Am I worth following? Um, Jesus was a king. Not just a king, but the king of kings, the, the Lord of lords. And he brought a kingdom to earth, the kingdom of heaven. And uh, this verse, I, I never saw this before until this week. Luke twenty two twenty nine. I love what this verse is saying to us. And I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me. Here's what he's saying. My father gave me the kingdom of heaven and told me to bring it to earth. Our goal as disciples of Jesus is not just to live a decent life, die, and experience heaven in the future. We're to experience heaven, the kingdom of God, right now. Every time we obey Jesus as king, we do what he wants us to do. We experience the kingdom of God right now. But he's conferred upon us his kingdom. And he wants us to be kings and queens who bring his kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. Did you catch that? And so every man in this room is called to be a king. A good king. And the world is desperate for good kings. The world needs good kings because there's so many bad kings. So when you think about bad kings, who comes to mind right now? Maybe Putin. <laughs> maybe pastors who've gone bad. Hillsong, Mars Hill. You know. uh, maybe Harvey Weinstein in, in Hollywood. Maybe some president you're thinking of. Pastor, president, I don't know. Who, who you like, who you didn't like. Whenever there's leaders that... Uh, use their power against people, to diminish people, and to grow their kingdom at others' expense, we say that's a bad king. That's a bad king. The world needs good kings with good character so that the people underneath their influence can flourish and experience the kingdom of God. So how do men grow as kings? Uh, number one, by becoming ridiculously responsible. You have to take responsibility. You don't blame other people for what's going wrong in your home or your business or your simple church or your ministry. You take responsibility. If you're in charge, you're responsible. You own it. That's what good kings do. Good kings are humble. Okay? They don't blame other people. Um, Steve Kerr, I'm a Warriors fan. Any Warrior fans out there? Okay. I just realized last night the Avs were even playing. I'm still kind of like recovering from the... The NBA championships, but I came from San Francisco. Love Kerr. The reason I like Kerr is this. In, in press conferences, if his team plays poorly, he blames himself. He takes responsibility. If his team plays well, he gives them the credit for it. That's what good kings do. They take responsibility. And, and number two, uh, we become good kings by letting God grow our character. How do you do that? You surround yourself with godly men, other kings who are good kings. Uh, Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So every man needs a band of brothers, a group of men who, who help each other grow in character, who challenge each other, who hold each other accountable. That's why in simple churches we do this with each other. We have some simple churches that are just men trying to work through some stuff in their past that are holding each other accountable. Uh, we talk right here a lot about we're the average of our cl five closest friends. Might be a good time to evaluate that real quick, guys. Who are your five closest friends? And do you admire their character? Do you want to be like them? Because you're going to be like the people you hang around. Uh, number two is we can let our Heavenly Father train us to grow in character. Uh, Hebrews 12, 12 verse 7 says, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father. Uh, as men, we need to re-paradigm hardship and obstacles and problems. We need to see them as opportunities, as part of God's training plan to grow us and mature our character. It says he's using hardship as a good father to train us. The word there for discipline means to train. He's training us to grow in character. Heraclitus, who was a uh, Greek philosopher, once said, character is destiny. Uh, your character will determine what kind of king you are or are not. It's important we let our Heavenly Father help us become men of great character. So let's let Jesus, who's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, make us into great kings. Because the world needs great kings. Um, last stage is the sage stage. Come on, for you Lord of the Ring fans. Come on. Okay. Sorry, I missed an Aragorn. Okay. All right. So behind every great king, there's a, there's a great sage who's helping them become good kings. So you got King Arthur at the, the Knight of the Round Table, you know. He's got his knights around him. He's put, they're putting their swords on there. What's he doing? He's helping warriors become become great kings. That's what sages do. And the question that a man has to answer in this stage of his journey is, do I have wisdom to offer? Uh, this is Jesus with his 12 disciples. He spent 90% of his time with the disciples helping them become kings. He could confer upon them 
his kingdom. Uh, God has been inviting me into this stage as I'm getting older. Uh, I've been playing the king role for quite a while. I've been pastoring churches for 30 years. But in recent years, we've helped start 46 churches, and so I'm becoming a pastor of the pastors of our churches. And now we've got a bunch of people in the city who are very fascinated by what we're doing with our simple church movement because it's growing rapidly, and we're seeing all kinds of life change, and we're seeing quality, like really quality disciples being made in our movement. And so I've got these pastors wanting to know, what's going on? And will you train me? And then we've got this team. If you haven't noticed, um, our team is a young team. And it's kind of scary, but biologically, I could be the father of everyone on our team. I could be Billy's dad, okay? That's how old I am. Yeah. But I love this stage. It's kind of scary because, you know, most men, we don't feel like we're worthy of being considered a sage. But we're needed. Like the young kings and the young queens around us, they need us. And so I'm learning to love this stage. It's not about me anymore. If you're a sage, it's not about you. Give up your power. Give it away. You know, be the wind underneath the wings of, of these young kings. Give them opportunity. Give them everything you've got. That's what we're made to do in this stage. That's why I don't, I don't teach all the time. These guys need it. They've got incredible teaching gifts. Stronger than mine, let them teach. Okay. Sages give their power away and they give their wisdom away as well. Um, men in the latter stage of their lives were not meant to just go around golfing and looking for the best ice cream in malls and collecting those seashells in Florida that I talked about earlier. Okay. That's not the way a man should end his life. We're needed for the world to be led by great kings. We need to be sages and give our wisdom to them and give our love and our blessing to them as well. So how does a man become a sage? Well, you got to do your work in the earlier stages, and we always have work to do in our earlier stages. You can fill in the gaps and ask your heavenly father to father you where you have gaps. And then uh, always be a sage to the generation behind you. So you don't have to be an old guy like me to start being a sage for the generation behind you. You can do it right now. And that's one of the really cool things about our church is we're very multi-generational. If you haven't noticed, that's a value of ours. And so we have high school students pouring in to the lives of middle school students and discipling them and giving them wisdom. We have college students pouring into high school students. We have 20-somethings in the brook, young adults pouring into college students, and so on and so forth. Okay. That's the, a very beautiful thing about our church. And so start being a sage now. Pour in to the people who are younger than you. Disciple them, mentor them, give them your wisdom. Okay. So here's our question. The question of every man. Am I man enough? Am I man enough? Do not take that question to your work or to your women or to your world. They can't answer that question for you. The only one who can answer that question for you is your heavenly father. And he's saying to you right now, you are man enough. You are man enough. And let me help you become the man I made you to be. So a little review. The stages of a man's journey. Here they are. Your heavenly father wants to, he wants to father you through every single one of these stages. Um, do you have a gap in your past being the beloved son? He wants you to know beyond a shadow of doubt that you are the beloved son of God, that you are deeply loved. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, for you. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're missing out on fully embracing God's love for your life. I would encourage you even today in this moment, just receive Jesus Christ's love for you, his forgiveness, and go get baptized as soon as possible so that God can savor you when he serves your son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Do you have a gap in the, in the cowboy stage as a man? God wants to bring you on an adventure, his adventure. The only adventure large enough for your soul. He, he wants you to be wild and dangerous, but in a good way. Do you have a gap as a man in the warrior stage? God wants to awaken you to the fact that there's a spiritual battle going on around you every single day for your heart and for the hearts and souls of others. And he wants to teach you how to fight. He wants to teach you how to use the weapons he's given you. Do you have a, a, a gap or a hole in the, uh, the king stage? He wants to grow your character. He wants to make you into a good king because the world so desperately needs good kings. He wants to mentor you because Jesus Christ, his son, is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Um, God wants to help you become a sage. He's the, he's the source of all wisdom and he wants to pour his wisdom into you so that you can create great kings. 
whatever stage you're in, he wants to father you and help you become a man of God. A man who every time he asks the question, am I man enough, you hear the voice of God saying, yes, you are man enough. And as a church, we're going to leave you alone in this process, this masculine journey we're all on. And so we've got a retreat coming up, uh, some details here. Love the beer, by the way. Um, August 12th through the 14th, Scott Fuag, who I think is in the room, maybe, maybe not. Um, he's going to help lead this retreat. We're going to go back through these stages. We're going to do some work. It's not going to be uh, some kind of weird men's retreat where you get naked and you, you know, play bongos or something, okay? We're not doing that kind of stuff. I mean, we're, not, we're not smoking peyote or something like that. No, this is, this is going to be a, a Jesus-centric men's retreat. We're going to go back through these stages and we're going we're to encourage each other and strengthen each other and let God father us. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you that you are the perfect father. You are the perfect father. And uh, Father, we, we love our fathers, but they all had gaps, and therefore we have gaps. And so we desperately need you as men. We need you as our father. We need you to answer all of our questions, especially the question, am I man enough? And Father, I believe that through your word you've been answering that question today. And so as men, whatever you've said to us, whatever word you've given to us today, uh, I pray we hang on to it and we'd own it and would be transformed by it. And may we become a church full of godly men who raise up other godly men for generations to come. To the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.